Okay, um, welcome. So I am Amelia Glazer. I am an associate professor of literature and of, uh, I'm also the director of the Russian, East European and Eurasian Studies program. And I'm really pleased to be here with Jennifer Croft, author and translator, and uh, most recently in the news as the, um, the translator of Olga Tokarczuk, who won the Nobel Prize in Literature this past year. Um, so I'm going to be talking with, uh, with Jennifer a bit about her translation, also a little bit about her writing and her development as a Slavist and as a translator. Um, so thanks so much for being with me. Um, so I want you to just... Yeah, and joining us from LA. We were actually going to have this uh, meeting in person, but we're going to be recording it virtually instead. Um, so, and uh, Jenny, just to let you know, if you hear any sounds in the background, it's just my family who all have very loud voices. Uh, okay, so I, I wonder if you can talk just a little bit about your, your path to becoming a translator, how you, um, how you chose uh, translation, did you stumble into it as many people do? Um, talk a bit about your about yourself. Yeah, I did kind of stumble into it. I always wrote and I started studying Russian when I was um, 13 years old. And so I majored in Russian and English at the University of Tulsa. I grew up in Oklahoma and I went to school there and I minored in creative writing. And as I was finishing my degree, I was kind of scrambling to think what I would do next. And um, my Russian professor at the University of Tulsa had had us do some literary translation. I was really lucky um, to be able to work with a great Russian poet, one of the best known Russian poets of the 20th century, Evgeny Yevtushenko, who taught at the University of Tulsa for many years. Um, so in my Russian classes, we translated some of him and we translated some other things. And I started thinking about that. I, I probably wouldn't have been aware of translation as a career, certainly, or even as an activity that, that gets done in the, in the same way that so many people don't think about translation, although it is part of our daily lives, had it not been for that. So um, I then decided to apply for our master's programs and I, um, went to do an MFA at the University of Iowa, which is a long-standing and wonderful program in literary translation. And while I was there, I discovered Polish and I kind of slowly transitioned from Russian to Polish. Um, and then eventually later also added Spanish. Uh, so there are, you know, there are not a lot, it's not that easy to become a literary translator, at least, you know, financially, although I do have a number of students who um, occasionally come to me and say, uh, this is something I think I might want to pursue. Um, we do have, you know, some paths for doing it. There are schools of translation, there are MFA programs. Um, you've uh, been incredibly successful. You've won the Man Booker Prize for translation, which is really kind of the top prize that a translator can uh, can win. You've won the Michael Henry Heim Prize. You've had an NA, NI, NEH, a Fulbright. Uh, do you have advice for um, young translators, perhaps college students who are considering this as a career path, who are um, uh, strong speakers of a couple of languages um, as a way of actually supporting themselves as a translator. Right. I mean, so it's definitely a case of having to cobble together a living. And I have been pretty creative about um, getting paid for a while. So the first thing that worked for me was to go, I got a Fulbright, as you said, and I went, I moved to Poland for a while. And my first jobs came from the contacts that I made while I was actually in the country that I wanted to translate from. So I think that's really important because um, when I was first translating and even still some of the best paid translations are not the avant-garde novel that you might have just really enjoyed reading. I mean, Flights is now successful and I won the booker for it and that was great and lucrative, but it took 10 years for me to find a publisher for flights. Um, and I was trying a lot, like I was really approaching editors pretty frequently and trying to publish excerpts in magazines. And so 
The first thing I would say is to be really patient because these things take a really long time. The second thing I would say is to be, you'd have to be flexible in terms of what you're willing to translate. So I know some really well-known literary translators also do a lot of technical translation. I've done more kind of academic translation um, and all, all sorts of other like plays that people hire me to do and so forth. And I also was able to make that work by living mostly in a place that had a good exchange rate with the dollar. So I was living in Argentina for seven years and I was able to get by in Argentina um, just translating stuff from Polish and getting paid in złoty or in dollars or in euros or whatever and exchanging that into Argentine pesos. But that's a fairly complex maneuver and I think a lot of people would um, maybe balk at that. There are also these grants which are, I don't know what I would have done without the NEA support, um, which is something that's really good to apply for for emerging translators. Um, and is actually less competitive than the Penn Hein grant, which receives so many applications. So that NEA is a really wonderful um, source of support. But yeah, it's um, it's not it's certainly not the best paid career, and you would have to you would have to really be passionate about it and be doing the projects that you really love alongside these other projects that pay the bills. This is the difficult news that I feel like I have to deliver to students when they come to me because people do get excited about translation and I, I, I know that there are ways of, you know, some literary translators actually manage to have a, let's say, business translation gig on the side where they can also um, support themselves, but um, it is somewhat frustrating that something so important is, um, you know, feels like the path of a, you know, a struggling musician. Yeah. Um, I, um, I wanted to go back to something you just said, though, um, that it took you 10 years to find a publisher for flights. Um, so you, I mean, I, I, this is the book that got to Kartrick the Nobel Prize um, mm -hmm. in your translation, um, one could argue, because, of course, uh, the Nobel Prize Committee um, tends to be more likely to read English than, uh, than Polish. Um, so you identified this book. Um, how did you come across it? How did you make the decision that you needed to get this into English? Um, did you find a publisher before completing the translation? Uh, talk us through that process. Sure. Yeah, so the other thing that I feel like I didn't know beforehand is that, um, at least in my experience, so much of the work of the translator is not actually translation. So in addition to doing the business side of stuff like invoicing and all of that, there's all of this salesmanship or promotion. So I have, I set up Olga's Facebook page, for example, and um, I'm the one who wrote the summary of the book and who did, who translated excerpts and scheduled meetings with people in New York and London. And um, I was always, uh, like I said before, kind of approaching people and I kept getting turned down on this one. I felt very strongly about it. I had discovered Olga when I was still at the University of Iowa. She had published a collection of short stories that they happened to have in the university library. And I was looking around for Polish writers, having come to Polish literature from scratch. Um, and I found a few that I really liked. And the books that I've translated, it's always kind of worked in the same way that I just read the book, I fall in love with the book. and I start thinking about how I would transform it into English. Um, so Olga's voice immediately really resonated with me. I really love how kind of accessible yet also very ambitious she is and she's unique in a way in that. So I knew I wanted to translate her. She was already being translated by Antonia Lloyd-Jones into English, who's a London-based translator. So the first thing that I did was reach out to her. I don't remember now, this was like 2002, so I don't remember now exactly how I tracked her down, but I contacted her first and, and I said, I'm just finishing up an MFA in translation. I've translated this other book now from Polish by Hannah Kral. And I would really like to translate a short story by Olga to start out with, but I wanted to see if that would be okay with you. 
um, which is something I really recommend to people who are starting out in translation because it does tend to be kind of an intimate relationship between the writer and the translator. And in my case, Antonia turned out to be extremely helpful. So she was very supportive of my also translating Olga. She had a million other projects to do. She was very close friends with Olga and she put me in touch with Olga in turn. Um, and then when Flights was published in Polish in 2007, I loved it. At that point, I was in a PhD program and I was, um, it really kind of clicked with me in terms of all of the other things I was reading at that time. And it felt really fresh and really innovative. And I really wanted to do that. And it's worked out really nicely between me and Antonia so far that um, Olga is a very diverse writer. So she has like lots of different interests and different styles. And Antonia likes kind of like one side of Olga and I really like the other side. So we've complemented each other really nicely. Antonia um, was happy for me to translate flights. And I was happy for her to translate the book that came after that, which is called Drive Your Plow Over the Bones of the Dead, which is like an eco thriller. Um, so I started working on it and I, translated like something like 50 pages in the beginning. I remember I started the translation while I was on a grant, an unrelated grant in Berlin. I always was like skimming off the top of, like I got <laughs> funding for academic work and funding for creative writing and funding for translation. And I've always kind of tried to maintain all of these projects in parallel. Um, so yeah, I translated some of it and then I put it on pause as I was trying to sell it and then I, by the time it finally sold in 2017, I had translated about half of it and published, I don't know how many pages, something like 70 pages in different magazines. And um, when we finally, the negotiations took a while for the, for the publisher and that was the UK publisher, which is called Fitzcarraldo. It's a small independent, house run by Jacques Testard and he's done an amazing job of just building this fabulous list of international and British fiction totally from scratch in just a few years. Um, so he wanted the trans, once we finally got everything signed, he wanted the translation pretty quickly. So it took me about 10 years to translate the first half of the book and then like two months to translate the second half of the book. Um, and then actually when it was first published, it didn't really do much. There weren't very many reviews. It didn't seem like people were really paying attention. Antonia had published translations of Olga's before, like House of Day, House of Night, which is a wonderful novel, or Primeval and Other Times, which is a wonderful novel. And people didn't really pay that much attention. And so it wasn't until this international Booker Prize process began that Olga started really developing a fan base in the English speaking world because we got a lot of publicity from that and there were a lot of interviews and photos of her and she's adorable and um, people started really coming in droves to her work at that point. Yeah. Um, this is, this is great. I want to, um, I want to go back to your writing a little bit as well. Um, so I, um, I actually just finished reading Homesick, I think, uh, last mm -hmm. week. It's beautiful book. Um, I, um, it, you know, this kind of intellectual coming of age. Uh, I mean, I personally really adored it as, as an older sister with the younger sister. I just Aww. felt like it was a, a really beautiful tribute to that relationship, even people that have a, you know, very different kind of uh, sibling relationship. Um, but you, you hint in that book, it's kind of, this kind of intellectual coming of age, and you hint at your love of languages and cultures, but you don't specifically, you kind of stop short of becoming a translator in the book. Right. It's other things, right? You become a photographer, uh, or that I shouldn't say you, I should say your protagonist, because right. it is a, um, a, a, a fictionalized a, account that you've um, acknowledged being quite close to a... Um, some of your own experiences, but um, the protagonist doesn't, you know, doesn't become a translator, even though as someone who translates, I see, I see her moving in that direction. And of course, knowing who you are. Um, can you talk a little bit about balancing your own writing and your own writer's voice with your translator's voice? Yeah. Well, I, like I said, I always wrote and I always thought of translation as a very good kind of apprenticeship in writing. So 
the whole time that I was translating Olga, I was also studying under Olga and kind of like learning her techniques and her paying attention to her sense of humor and her voice and all of the elements of literature. And I did that with everybody I translated. And from each person, I feel like I was very careful and mindful about taking certain elements. Um, and then the Homesick, which is the first book that I published, is totally a result of translation. Um, because I started writing it while I was living in Argentina and I started writing it in Spanish. And then as I went along, I really wanted my real younger sister to be able to read it. And so I started writing a version in English and then I, and then I became really interested in how I would do this. And I, I was in the middle of my dissertation, um, my PhD dissertation at the time. So everything else that I had been writing, fiction that I had been writing, had kind of taken on this academic style, which can be, um, it could work in fiction, but it can be very difficult to pull off in fiction. And suddenly I gave myself all of these new limitations so that whenever I started a sentence, I had to really think about where I wanted to go with that sentence. And I had to be guided, not by linguistic associations, but by kind of the content of um, what I needed to convey. And, and the also, thinking that I was speaking to this totally new audience gave me a completely new perspective on Oklahoma where I grew up, which I had absolutely no interest in before, to be honest. And then suddenly it became this really fascinating and beautiful place in my mind. Um, so it was really a translation based thing that allowed me to discover this new style, which is kind of simple in a way, but also I tried to play with word order and, um, things, syntax that I took from Slavic languages, for example, to slightly defamiliarize things that would be very familiar to an American audience, like going to college and being in a dorm, which is something that I explained to an Argentine audience because they don't have the same kind of campus that we, most countries don't have the same kind of campus that we have in the US. Um, so in order to kind of have a similar effect of seeing through the eyes of a character who's also coming to this having no idea what's going on, I tried to keep the sentences really simple and intelligible, but also just make them slightly not what you would normally say. Um, and that is a style that I'm trying to, I'm actually writing now, it's not a sequel at all, but it is about um, a translator and it's kind of like, a, it's, this is not autobiographical. It's a translator's revenge story because the book she's translating has stolen from her, from her life. And this is, she's translating the book of her ex-boyfriend in Argentina. None of that happened to me, but. Um, so in a way it does though pick off, pick up where Homesick left off, which is with this discovery of translation and, and the transformative power of that work. Do you, um, do you find that the voices you translate affect your own writing voice? Yeah, I think about that a lot because there's, I know some writers who won't even read, they won't read anything while they're working on a novel because they don't want to be like infected by um, anybody else's voice. And I guess, I mean, I would say like, I wouldn't translate two different authors in the same day. I usually need like a night to reset. I kind of would do a little bit of my own writing and then translate someone in the same day, but it is, it is kind of like a delicate balance. And I just try to be as aware as possible of um, everybody's different styles and different concerns and interests. And I hope that I'm I mean, I'm also always thinking of, I think all translators are, or most translators are thinking about the extent to which we are the protagonists of the target language texts. And there is a question like that's, our voices are definitely there. When you read Olga Tokarczuk, you're definitely reading Jennifer Croft in English, when you read Olga Tokarczuk in English. But then I wondered to what extent Olga Tokarczuk begins to sound like Federico Falco, the Argentine writer whose book I just translated. Um, and so I, it, it's something that we all try to be really careful about, but it is kind of 
inevitable that there's this human element to translation that takes over at some point. I want to read um, just a tiny excerpt of this piece uh, about the quarantine that you just published in The New Yorker a week or two ago. Is that all right? I'll just read um, a very short passage of your translation. And this came out on April 8th, 2020, A New World Through My Window. And I believe it had been published in a couple of different languages before your English translation had been published. It was already kind of making the rounds on the internet. Uh, and it's not through any fault of my own, I will say. I translated it immediately, but the New Yorker had a little bit longer it has time its, than the previous. <laughs> it has its, it takes its time, right, yeah. as I heard. Uh, so for this is just uh, a little ways in. Uh, for the longest time, I have felt that there's been too much world, too much, too fast, too loud. So I'm not experiencing any isolation trauma, and it isn't hard on me at all to, uh, to not see people. I'm not sorry that the cinemas have closed. I am completely indifferent to the fact that shopping centers have shuttered. I do worry, of course, when I think of all the people who have lost their jobs. But when I learned of the impending quarantine, I felt something like relief. I know many people felt similarly, even if they also felt ashamed of it. My introversion, long strangled and abused by hyperactive extroverts, has brushed itself off and come out of the closet. And, and then, of course, she goes on to talk about the darker sides of the yeah. quarantine and the way this world is going to change and that there's this kind of exaggeration of all of the stratification and, and um, you know, some of the negatives that we already experience. Um, but I wanted to read just a little bit of, of uh, your voice channeling her voice to ask you about her Polish, to ask you what, um, what you have to think about as you're translating to Karchuk and perhaps, you know, things that you have to think about that you don't with others. Sure. Um, well, so when you're translating from a Slavic language, one thing that I'm really interested in is word order. I mentioned that in the context of homesick, but um, there's also, well, it's different when you're translating versus when you're trying to construct something already in English that sounds um, slightly unusual. So one thing that is always a problem, not only with Volga, but with any Polish writer, is how to keep the order of the information the same or similar. You know, she carefully decides, she's such a master at this, of when to deploy an emotion or a fact. And it has a really strong effect depending, if you end a sentence with the word pain, it has a stronger effect probably than if you have it somewhere buried in the middle and there are other words around it and you kind of get a little bit lost and that the Polish is much more flexible about word order than English is. So it's impossible to keep it exactly the same, but it's something that I always try to compensate for. If I have to lose emphasis in one sentence, then I try to put it somewhere else. And in Olga, the specific thing about Olga that she does, aside from that balance that I mentioned of being really accessible, but ambitious at the same time. So I always try to keep the language kind of easy to read, somewhat rhythmic. She has this kind of lyrical style that's really pleasurable and almost soothing to read, even when she's saying something that is really dark or disturbing in her novels. You feel kind of like contained and taken care of as you're getting this like more difficult, as you're going through this more difficult experience. So that's a voice thing. Um, and then she has this I think her philosophy, part of her philosophy at least, is about the interconnectedness of all things in the world. She's a very environmentally friendly writer and she thinks a lot about the ways in which everything in nature is connected. And then she's also, she trained as a psychologist, so she also thinks about the ways in which people are connected more subtly than we might normally consider. Um, so she, in Slavic languages also, you have a lot of very recognizably related words that are related through their root. And she's really good at kind of weaving these intricate tapestries where you have these recurring threads of words that are related. And that's something that I can't, I can't recreate that exactly. I try and use words that seem to go together or seem to kind of like I mean, the very title, Flights, which isn't the title in Polish. The title in Polish, which is Bikuni, means 
It's a weird word that a Polish reader wouldn't know, but it refers to an 18th century Eastern Orthodox sect of people who ran in order to escape the devil. It comes from the root bieg, which is run. I would have guessed the runners, but as a Russian. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I could have translated it as runners. People initially assumed people who, Polish people who were preparing promotional materials for it in English assumed that it would be called runners. But I chose flights because I wanted something that would work in the same way of kind of connecting a lot of different, um, because also flights is a novel that's made up of seemingly unconnected fragments, yet they are connected in this kind of subterranean, beautiful, nuanced way. So flights works for me because there is a lot of actual travel in the book, but Flights has these other associations. It does have the association of fleeing, which is there in the original. And then it has like, there are phrases like flights of fancy and there are all of these kind of imaginative reveries in the book. And so I try to be careful. Obviously I put a lot of thought into that title and I don't necessarily put that same, I can't, I don't have the time to do that for every single sentence or every single word. But I try to make everything connected, as connected as possible. And maybe that's just, it can be like a rhyme sometimes that I put in the prose or um, alliteration, something that kind of makes sure that you know that this idea up here is connected with this idea down here. It's, uh, it's incredibly, it's an incredibly difficult novel. Um, it's a novel where you're um, constantly, at least as the reader, I was constantly surprised at what would come next. You have all of these different, you know, seemingly unconnected passages that are, are linked up. Um, do you are, what is your system for, uh, for checking your work, uh, for checking the translations? That's a great question. Um, I've been thinking about that recently because um, a dear friend of mine, Ellen Elias Bursach, who translates Bosnian, Croatian, Serbian, um, was telling me about one of her recent projects that she co-translated. I think it's a collection of short stories and she and her collaborator read aloud each of their translations and then responded and they went through so carefully. And I would love to have something like that. What I do have is Jacques at Fitzcarraldo, my editor, who goes through, he's, he's so amazing and all of his books are impeccably edited. Another thing that he can do specifically in the case of Olga is that while he doesn't read Polish, he is completely fluent in French, having grown up partly in France. And he refers, he compares my translation with the French translation, which is kind of an unusual approach. And he is aware that it's not a perfect one. So he, he would never say like, you're wrong here because the French translation says something else because obviously the French translator is also human who's made certain decisions and has kind of intervened in her own way. Um, but it's nice that way I make sure that because sometimes I'm working with several different files, for example, with the book that I just translated by Olga, the books of Jacob, which is 1127 pages. I had the Word document that she sent me before she sent it to the publisher, and then I had the PDF, and then I had this and that and whatever. And it's such a big book. One of my things that made me panic was, what if I accidentally skip a sentence, for example? Like, what if I'm just translating as quickly as possible and I miss a sentence, I just don't see it. So with his strategy of comparing it with another translation, at least he would notice a, terrible omission, an unforgivable omission like that. And then I, of course, I send it to Olga, but Olga has many translators and she loves, like we, I've gotten to know the other translators um, over the years and we have like a really nice community and she loves to work with us and she's so supportive of us, which is not always the case. So we got really lucky with that. And she also just kind of recognizes that my translation is this co-production that we're doing and I really have taken over. And if I have questions, she's always available, but she doesn't really check. She doesn't check in, which I think is probably healthier for her too, because she's also always working on her next project and she doesn't want to be bogged down. So I, I of course have to ask what it's like 
having translated a Nobel laureate, um, the process of having your translation um, suddenly catapulted into the international sphere like that. Um, I mean, it must be an incredibly gratifying feeling. Uh, can, you, can you talk a little bit about that experience of going Yeah, well, well it, it goes, that question goes really nicely with the excerpt that you read from the New Yorker piece. I was, I've been predicting for a while um, that she would win the Nobel Prize. I had a very strong sense that that would happen. And I, in fact, as I was trying to sell flights, I told every editor I approached that she was definitely going to win the Nobel Prize. <laughs> and now they're all kicking themselves. Um, but, so I was ecstatic when she won. I was, even though I wasn't shocked, I was just, I was so excited. And I, that they announced that at four o'clock in the morning, California time. So um, I was up at four o'clock in the morning in tears of ecstasy, terrifying my cats who spent the whole day furious with me for having aw aw awoken them in the middle of the night and screamed and so forth. But once that passed, my main concern was for Olga's introversion, which I share. And I remembered that after we won the Booker, that was kind of an unprecedented level of attention for both of us, even though Olga has been a bestseller in Poland mm -hmm. for many years, um, as well as a critical success. She has never had this kind of international recognition. And um, we had a great time doing the Booker tour and so forth, but it became overwhelming pretty quickly. And so when she, when it was announced that she got the Nobel Prize, I immediately became really worried about her mental health. <laughs> and just her, her, she also is just such a generous person that she will agree, she would at the time still agree to like any, anyone who wanted to interview her for like this tiny village podcast in Poland or anything like that, which would mean also that she would not have any time to write. Um, so I went to Poland before we all went to Stockholm together and spent a week um, trying to like make sure that she, she was totally fine. I mean, it was overwhelming and it was stressful, but she's, she's a pro. So she came through it with flying colors. Amazing. So the final question, I, I want to, I need to let you go. And, um, but I do have one more question. Uh, advice to students, uh, especially students of Slavic languages and literatures who um, might be considering taking on translation. I think just aside from going to the country, which I think is the most important thing. I mean, unless, unless you're a heritage speaker, for instance, or, or you have some other connection, I think it's so important to go to the country and there's so many things that are not there in the dictionary and um, and also context that you can make. But aside from that, I always say that it's really important to be reading as widely as possible, not only in, if you're a translator of Russian, not only in Russian, but also in English because you're translating into this whole canon of contemporary American literature or um, whatever your version of Anglophone is. Um, and it's important to know exactly what you're doing. So you're not just automatically making it English. You could be imitating the style of Rachel Cusk or Sally Rooney or whomever, or making like a conscious mixture of these various people. So I think just read as much as possible and travel as much as possible. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you.